Good morning. Let's go ahead and begin our worship here today. It is good to be in the Lord's house this Memorial Day weekend. David is not here. They're having Decoration Day somewhere way up in the hills. So I am down here in this, well, it's not the flatlands, but it's, I'm down here with you guys, and we're going to lead you in worship. Let's stand this morning as we just open up with my eyes and sing the glory. just get all distracted here right now. Uh, every time I hear this song, I think of my daddy. All right? Now, my daddy was an 82nd Airborne Trooper. And they had a version of this song that didn't go like this. So anyway, we won't get into that. But it just always, as I was listening, as I was singing it just this morning, I could hear my daddy. And I sure, well, I'm not going to start. <laughs> but it is good to be in the Lord's house. And it's good to be able to celebrate our freedoms in a country that has been blessed. And I pray we'll seek once again the blessing and the favor of the Most High God. Let's keep singing this morning. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circle camps. I have built a hymn and not during the evening news of them. I can read his righteousness in it by the dim. Hey, you may be seated for just a moment, and I'm going to bounce and get you back up here in just a moment, and up and down. That's one of the, you know, they didn't tell us that I'd be able to do that when I was in, in college, all right? You know, I always thought we were just going to get up and preach, and but I get to have people up and down and up and down. I'm actually an exercise instructor. Didn't you guys know that? So anyhow, you got that for free. Hey, just real quickly in your announcements, just a couple of things. Next Saturday, I think, our ladies are having a uh, a. a a din uh, uh, yeah, a luncheon, that's what it's called, a luncheon for the uh, ladies' ministry as they're initiating it, or, or the ministry of ladies. I think that's what they're going to call it. Not the ladies' ministry, but the ministry of women or the ministry of ladies, which I think is, is a subtle change but a profound change, simply because it talks not just about ministry we receive, but more importantly, ministry that we give, which is the, uh, the pathway to refreshment here this morning. Also, uh, Bible, uh, not Bible school, but uh, 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 camps are coming up. Uh, the uh, applications are out there on the foyer table, 
and you need to pick one up and fill them out and get them sent in. If you want to be a volunteer, you need to let me know. There's always room for volunteers, especially in children's camp. So join with us if you'd like to do that. Uh, so that's out there. We're going to take and uh, do some fundraising. We're going to do the majority of our fundraising after camp simply because of time pressures now. But we want to make sure every kid goes to camp. So if there's financial needs, please let me know, and we will try and address that as best as we possibly can. Also, in your bulletin, you will also see the results of our board meeting, our, of our uh, uh, board elections last week. I'm not going to take and announce them. They're in there, and I will uh, be emailing or texting everybody this week who's on the board and uh, looking forward to working with you and serving with you this year. I pray that God would use you and. God would bless your faithfulness in service here this uh, next year. So plan on that. Tuesday night we have food pantry. And let me make, I'm going to just make an announcement here right now. Uh, I love doing food pantry. I say it every week and I really thoroughly enjoy that. Uh, but we need one more English speaking person with, I don't want to say a strong personality, but a strong enough personality. All right. And I say that because sometimes we have folks that come through because we have a lot of our Hispanic ladies set up down there and they, they, walk, they walk people through down there. And I'm checking people in upstairs and I take care of the, any, any uh, issues that may arise up there. But sometimes I have folks that once they're out of my sight and they go down there, it's not that, yes it is, they do take advantage of folks that are timid about trying to speak English. All right, I'm not the least bit timid about speaking English, and I'm not too timid about trying to speak Spanish. I will talk to you. Uh, but I need somebody who will be involved in that ministry. It's only about an hour, hour and a half on, on Tuesday nights. It's, and it's really, again, uh, aside from Wednesday night, which I get to work with kids and teenagers, and, uh, and then, uh, but apart from Wednesday night, Tuesday night is probably one of my favorite nights of the week because I get to meet folks who need Jesus. I get a chance to see them all the time. And that's an opportunity for us as a body of believers to, whether that people attend church with us or not, to become their church. And that's who we are is the church. So I'm just letting you know, it starts at 6 o'clock. Generally, again, we're through by 645 at the very latest 7. But a strong, uh, an English speaker who does not mind uh, speaking English to the folks who need to understand. All right, so that's, that's, that's that, all right? So, and you can look at the other announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, we will be having a back-to-school, no, 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 not a back-to-school party, but a week from Wednesday we are planning on having uh, a gathering. I don't know if it's in the bulletin or not. A gathering of our kids on Wednesday night uh, for a farewell-to-school party, all right? So, and we're looking at getting not just not bounce houses, but the great big old water slides and stuff like that. So we're planning on getting wet. Do I have that date right, Barbara, the 8th? Okay, I want to make sure. Sometimes I do get my dates wrong. Any other announcements that we need to make real quick? Actually, I did, didn't I? <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just messing with you because you, you gave the details that I didn't have. So you want to say something else? Go ahead, please. That's exactly right. See, I wasn't thinking about people cooking. I think, I'm thinking bring more than enough for the folks that are there so Pastor Brady can get some, all right? So. Amen. And I do love the idea of the ministry of women. Yeah, I do like, love that. Barbara, you raised your hand before Lisa so rudely interrupted you. I know she didn't. I'm just messing with you. Ministry of Children's meeting is next next Sunday, at, right after the service, and we are going to take and I thought we talked about providing pizza or something like that. 
Yeah, we'll have, we'll have a lunch for you. If you don't like pizza or you can't eat pizza, I'm afraid you'll have to bring your own or route to the, uh, route to the icebox downstairs, all right? So, but that's uh, next Sunday afternoon, immediately following the service in the Sunday after, in, right, right after the morning service, all right? So, and... All right. Do we have that in the bulletin? Carol, is it in the bulletin? Okay. All right. So that's in the bulletin, and we'll put it out on Facebook and everything like that. I, I needed you to remind me of that because we talk about it, and then, you know, I move on, and I forget about what we've talked about. I'm going to enjoy old age, just so you guys know. All right? So, hey, let's continue our worship. Let's stand here this morning. It's just like Jesus here this morning. He is so good. You have my permission to clap. I cannot lead you in clapping, all right? Because I, I have absolutely no rhythm, all right? Just so none whatsoever. So put your hands together. There you go, Will. You do that one more time. I'll have you up here leading, all right? So let's put our hands together. Lift our hands. God has given us all that we have to worship him. So let us worship him with all that we have here today. Verse 3. When
you to come and pray. I invite you to the place of kneeling before the king. There's just something about that position of kneeling. I think when we kneel before him, something happens in our heart. We just become humble before him. So I invite you to pray. There's a lot of needs. Some of them you know, some of you don't know. Uh, but y'all keep Justin Smith in your prayers. I, I won't give any details this morning, but he, he could use a, a good word from folks and just your prayers here this morning. A number of folks are just sick. A number of folks are just down. And we just need to bring them before the Lord here this morning too. And if you haven't noticed, we are a nation in grieving right now. And grieving we should be. Because of the great loss that was perpetrated upon us in Uvalde, Texas this week. So let's, let's lift that up before the prayer. I know some say, well, it's not enough to give your thoughts and prayers. It may not be enough. 
but it's a good place to start and we need to do that here today when you're praying for that you need to be praying for your nation I know we sing God bless America and I know we we have these different hymns that we have used throughout history seeking and proclaiming God's blessing upon us as a nation but let me make sure you understand sin is a reproach to any people sin is a reproach to any nation righteousness exalts a nation and we are in a place today where God's people need to rise up not to point your finger but to rise up and bow down and call out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for revival for a rebirth of righteousness in our nation I can't do it I can't fix it I don't have a politician that I can elect no matter how I, much I agree with him that will fix what's wrong with our nation here this morning apart from a move of God all of us are lost and apart from a move of God our nation is lost here this morning well the scripture says in the book of Peter it says judgment will begin with the house of the Lord because we have received God's blessing and favor we have received God's truth so it will begin with the house of the Lord that's where it's going to start and I believe we've seen that already and are seeing more of it but just as sure as judgment begins with the house of the Lord this pastor here is convinced that blessing begins in the house of the Lord too as God's people come and really cry out to God for a lost and dying generation here this morning our altars are open come let's kneel as we sing this chorus through again today oh, awesome in this place Lord you have redeemed me you have called me from darkness into light you have given me your name you have given me the name of Christ to bear with myself here this morning and Lord I'm not deserving of that nor is anyone here today within the sound of my voice but I thank you Lord for your mercy Lord that that comes to me Lord when I'm not deserving in your grace that gives me what I need what I need when I'm not able and I praise you for that here this morning. And I thank you, Lord, for the sufficiency of your grace. Lord, it's not something I just read in the Word here this morning, though it is in the Word, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Jesus declares to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I, I know it's there, but Lord, I have learned firsthand of the sufficiency of God's grace. You are altogether wonderful. You are altogether good. You are altogether mighty. You are altogether for me here this morning and I bless your name for that well Lord just as true as that is for me Lord I believe it's true for every man woman and child who has ever drawn breath and Lord for those who are drawing breath today so Lord I pray Father that Lord you would raise up workers for the harvest Lord the harvest is white it's white unto harvest that means Lord I understand that that Lord there we have a limited time to reap the harvest that you have for us so Lord you're gonna have to raise up workers Lord, who are filled with compassion and, Lord, possessed with a passion, Lord, to win the lost here today. Father, I pray for our nation here this morning. Lord, I, I grieve, and I know when I saw that earlier this week, I, I saw that tragedy unfolding in Uvalde, Texas. Lord, my heart was just, it just dropped within me. And Lord, it just, I didn't even want to read the news. I didn't even want to see what else was coming, Lord. I had seen enough, and, and Lord, my heart just broke. Well, Lord, I pray, Father, for a hedge of protection around our children. Lord, be it 
with the sin of abortion, or Lord, be it with the sin of those who would harm the innocents among us. Father, we just need to pray a hedge of protection. And Lord, there are moments when we need to be that hedge. And Lord, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like in every situation, but Lord, we need as men and women of God to rise up and have done with lesser things and give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. What we saw earlier this week, Lord, was not just a tragedy. Lord, it was a profound picture of the soul sickness of a nation. And I know, Lord, that except you move, then we are lost as a nation. But, Lord, I have hope. Therefore, I call to mind. Because of the Lord's great compassions, we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. And Lord, I take heart from that here this morning. And I pray, Father, that as we move into our tomorrows, Lord, it will be with hopeful anticipation of what God is doing and what God will do in the days to come. Let us, Lord, work until there's no real breath in us. Work until there's no more strength. That we by, by any means, by all means, win some here today. Lord, bring it to pass. And I'm asking it this morning, and I'm receiving it by faith in the name and the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's declare this. continue this morning by the receiving of our tithes and our offering. If, uh, we're, I'm going to pray for it in just a moment. I did. There was one announcement that I failed to make, and that is next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, I am going to be doing a Sunday school class, and it will begin with uh, uh, a study of the Church of the Nazarene. And it's the, the, first, the first lesson will be the church. What is it? <laughs> that's, really, that's really the key. If we, don't, if we don't settle on who the church is, it don't matter what we call ourselves. So it, it, that's where we're going to start next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. So join with us here this morning. If you're not part of a uh, Sunday school class or not attending Sunday school, uh, you are encouraged to come and do it. When do you need to start? Well, there's no better time to start than next week. And I invite you to do that and be a part of that. So, And by the way, if you haven't been a part of John, the only issue, John, that I really have about starting a Sunday school class. I know I wasn't in there with you this morning because I was preparing in here. The only issue I have about starting a Sunday school class again is I don't get to sit under your teaching. And I just, that just, maybe you can just record it for me and I can share it some other time. How about that? If you've missed John's teaching, he is one of the better teachers that I've ever seen as a Sunday school teacher. And I appreciate your good work, your hard work. I understand what that's about. So, but let's, let's pray. And then let's come and let's receive our tithes and our offering this morning as an act of worship to the King here today. Father, we love you and we thank you again for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the ability and the opportunity to give. Bless us, Lord, now as we take and we pour out these blessings upon you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come as we worship. <laughs>
got permission from Pastor Brady and David to do an object lesson this morning instead of singing a song. I wanted to share something with you that the Lord had showed me a few days ago. But we were getting ready to come. I was going to be early so I could be set up with a microphone and everything. And I looked at Don in the car and I said, I feel like I'm forgetting something. And I said, I have got my phone, I've got my keys, I've got my water, I've got my object lesson, got halfway down the road, and I went, I forgot my teeth. (laughs) So I had to go back home, get my teeth. So anyway, I'm here. (laughs) Um, Have any of you ever thought about the word uh, crave? Have any of you maybe thought, oh, that looks, that look, I want that so bad I can taste it. And it may not necessarily be food. It might be that sparkly ring in the window or that brand new shiny truck. Or it might be a roomier home or it might be a vacation or even quality time with some of your loved ones that you just crave. You just want it so bad. Or in the case of food, you might think, I crave this so much that it just makes my mouth water. Like I did when I was pregnant with my first son, Eric. I craved ham and eggs for breakfast, and that was the only thing I could eat the whole nine months. And during the day, I wanted chili dogs with mustard and sweet relish the rest of the day and night. Nothing else would do. That was a, it was an actual craving. I guess my body needed it. I don't know. Hot dogs? I'm not sure about that. But anyway, to crave means a strong want, greatly desire, or long for, and sometimes to the point of affecting you even physically. And I'm going to give you an example. We have a blue healer. His name is Blue, of all things. But anyway, when we say treat, we get his total, complete attention. His ears stand up. He starts to sit. He doesn't, we don't even have to tell him to sit anymore. When he say, we say treat, he either sits up or he hits the ground all the way down with his, his face on the ground even. Well, if it's a buttery cracker, he begins to salivate out both sides of his mouth, seriously. And after a little while, if you can stand it and not laugh too much, there's a puddle of saliva on our porch. That's what you call craving. It can affect you physically. Well, early one morning, recently, My time with the Lord was so sweet and so peaceful and so satisfying that when it was time for me to get up and take care of my daily responsibilities, I found myself craving more of what I had just experienced. I asked God how I could have more of that. He immediately brought to my mind my newfound craving for a slice of warm, fresh Italian bread with a little bit of real butter and sometimes a second piece with butter and homemade muscadine jam. That was after I asked the Lord to show me how I could have more of what he had just given me with that fellowship and sweetness with him. I was so amazed and thankful that God teaches me deep spiritual truths using simple words and pictures that I can easily understand. Having been in the restaurant business for about 30 years, One of my ever-changing responsibilities was to do the baking. I made homemade hot rolls, cinnamon rolls, along with cakes, pies, and other desserts. So I understand what goes into bread making, the basic ingredients, the process, and how to get the results that you desire. There is a basic recipe for basic white bread that I'll share with you in in a couple of minutes, and then I'll tell you why shortly. But first, I just want to tell you a few of the varieties of bread available, bread recipes. On one website alone, I found over 18,000 recipes just for bread. Now, I want you to remember that. There's basic white bread, there's Italian, there's oatmeal, there's French, there's brioche, there's sourdough, potato bread, Hawaiian, Ezekiel bread, crumpets. I even found recipes for Methodist bread and Wesleyan bread. Really. 
Depending on what other non-basic ingredients you add, you can make donuts, you can make banana bread, cinnamon raisin, pumpkin, zucchini bread, chocolate bread, garlic, monkey bread, no monkey in, included in that one though, um, blueberry, lemon, cheddar, onion, and varied muffins and crackers. So you see, bread can be used for a side dish, it can be used for a main dish like pizza, it can be used for dessert, or bread can even be used in worship, like we do in communion. Okay, back to the basic recipe made of common everyday things. I've asked a few volunteers to come up and help me with this. Now's the time. I think I have two, and I need five more. Do I have five volunteers? All you have to do is hold a bag. You don't have to talk or anything. Come on up. If you want to volunteer, come on up. Children, too older ones that can stand still for a few minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I need one more. Go ahead. Come on. Seven. Okay. Let me dig out my basic ingredients here. Give me a minute. The first one is flour, of course. Would you hold that up so? Oh, I hope I didn't break anything. I decided to leave the eggs at home just in case. Okay. The first one is flour. The second one would be water. The third one would be sugar. I want you to notice how much is in each of these bags, too. Sugar, butter, salt, and yeast. And there is one more ingredient, but I'm not going to reveal it just yet. Okay. I want you to understand these are, this is a basic recipe for bread. And we're going to liken this to the church in just a few minutes. But for this, it's just a basic white bread recipe. So she has the flour. There are other grains that can be used, of course, like rye and whole wheat and stuff like that. She has the water. Now, you can also use milk or a combination of water and milk. This recipe will work. She has sugar. Notice the difference in the amount of flour and the amount of sugar. Sugar or honey or molasses or... Any kind of sweetener will work pretty much. Okay, butter. What's butter? Anybody know what butter is considered? Dairy, but it's also fat. You have to have fat in bread to make it tender. So it can be butter, it can be lard, it can be, what else? What's another one? Oil, olive oil. Okay. Okay, the next one is salt. See the amount of salt in there? Doesn't look like much, does it? There are different kinds of salt, too. There's Himalayan. There's all kinds. Sea salt, <laughs> definitely. Okay, and then yeast. I didn't open that package, but there's about a teaspoon of yeast in there. And that is what makes all of it work together to rise. And there are different kinds of yeast, believe it or not. There's sourdough starter and other things. Okay. If you guys would like to go sit down, you can, but not, not, not you. <laughs> uh, just, I'll tell you what, just put it on the floor right there. And thank you for your help. I appreciate it. If you want to sit down, you can. If you want to sit down, you can. Okay, now, how many of you would like to sit down to supper for, at a big bowl of flour? <laughs> How many? No hands. Okay. How about a big bowl of sugar? There may be some kids here that would like that. I figured that. Okay. How about a big bowl of butter? Nothing else, just a big bowl of butter. No? Okay. Salt? Anyone? Yeast? No? Okay. We mix those together and we get something new, a new creation. We get raw dough. 
We form it, we let it set a while to allow the yeast to work, and then we apply heat. You can play with that and make it work if you want to, if you're a firebug. <laughs> okay. And there's different kinds of heat as well. There's a, a brick oven, there's regular ovens that most of us use at home, there's microwave ovens, there's campfire, even just pure light, sunlight, that will be enough heat to bake something. And you know what? God designed it that way. He designed it so that after a while, after we ap apply the heat, and for our purposes today, I couldn't bring my oven, so just pretend can you <laughs> pretend this is the oven? But anyway, after it, it does what it's supposed to do, <laughs> guess what we end up with? Bread. A loaf of bread. Don't eat that, okay? Just leave it there. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? In the Bible, Jesus tells us that he is the living bread. Did you know that bread is something we have to have in order to live? It's life-giving, and it's life-sustaining. And Jesus tells us in God's word that anyone who comes to him shall not be hungry. What is the world hungry for? It's, isn't it hungry for love and acceptance? Aren't we, God's people, the church, supposed to be like Jesus? Shouldn't we represent him to the world to tell the lost? The church is, to me, it's like, and this is what God spoke to me, the church is like God's recipe for living bread. It's made up of simple things. We choose to give him our time. First of all, when you start out with a recipe, you have to have that dedicated time to put it all together, put it, watch it, put it in the oven, make sure it doesn't burn. Anyway, and then... The church, as a church, we have to dedicate our time to follow that recipe. We have to choose to seek him, get to know him better by opening his word, reading, studying, meditating on it. We have to choose to trust him with our whole heart. We have to give him our heart. We have to invite him in. That's a choice that we make. We have to choose to obey his precepts. His, the words that he's left, the example that he left when he lived on this earth as a human. We need to obey him. We need to choose to do that, to be like Jesus, who was the living bread. And also part of that recipe for God's uh, recipe for the living bread and for, uh, for church is that we need to pray. We need to uh, not only ask him for things that we need, but we also ask, ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is that fire, that power, that heat that transforms us to become that bread to a hungry, starving world. And just at, when I got ready to leave, I thought one more thing that I'd like to share with you is that, yes, the world craves love and acceptance, but only God is able to give the kind of love that will satisfy the soul and our, even our own cravings for love. So I just want to encourage you if, you, if you want more of him, seek him and ask him, and he will provide. I thought she was going to walk off and leave Byron sitting there. <laughs> God love you. I don't know about you guys, but all that talk of bread makes me feel like that little blue healer. <laughs> she, did, she didn't know it, but I'm over there. You feel that little, that little funny place right in your jaws when you begin to get hungry, you know, and it's just like I'm, I start salivating. I tried not to make a puddle over there, all right, so, but uh, it is good. Thank you so much for that. And uh, that's a good analogy, a good picture of the church. 
who we are supposed to be. By the way, this ain't church. This is the building we worship in. The church is a living organism. It's not an organization, but it is a living organism. Uh, the Spirit of God resides within it, within them, and the Spirit of God lives out through them. That's what the church really is about. Hey, if you got your Bibles, I, and, I, and I trust you bring your Bibles. If you don't, there's one in front of you. Some of you use electronics. Uh, uh, if you would, look at Joshua, Joshua, uh, verses chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We'll get to that in just, in just a few moments. Uh, in North Texas, in a little town none of you really know anything about, there's a little, uh, right up on the Red River, there's a little town by the name of St. Joe, St. Joe, Texas. As a matter of fact, when you look at the old westerns and you, uh, you hear about St. Joe and you'll, you'll always talk about it, it's on the Chisholm Trail, but anytime you hear about St. Joe in a western, it's talking about that little town. It's a little town of about 1,300 people. It's always been about that size and it will probably never grow any bigger than that. But that is my home place, or at least the place that my family originated from when they came to Texas in the oh, mid-1800s. So they were pioneers coming in on wagons and stuff. So that's, that's our home place. And uh, I remember as a child, some, because we already lived in Dallas, and it was never a place I lived, but we visited fairly often until about the time I was seven or eight years old. And then uh, the, the people that were the anchor, the, the grandmother that was the anchor there moved to Dallas. The grandfather had already died. So anyway, that's a little bit of history there. But all of our people are buried there. All of our people are buried there in the Mountain View Cemetery there in the Mountain Parks, Mountain View Cemetery there in St. Joe. And I'm the last generation that has any connection with it. Now, I told my children about it, and I've taken it at different times my children to St. Joe, Texas. And I show them, this is where your grandparents lived, this is where your grandpa got his hair cut, this is yada yada, all the different things that I remember as a child when that place seemed so big, and I go back to it now, and it's just a little bitty, 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 tiny place. It, you, you just, you, again, you, you can't hardly get there. But I'm the last one that has a connection to it. I've taken my children there a few times, Every time I'm going down 82, heading somewhere else. And I've made a few special trips on my own. But my children have no connection to it. There's no living connection to it. All they have is the heritage that their father has passed on to them. But I know that when I die and my brothers and sisters die, my children will not have any connection whatsoever with that. It will be a distant, dusty memory that is mine and not theirs. I even go there, I went there just a few weeks back as I was finishing off sabbatical and we went to the cemetery and, and it was well maintained. But there's one place in that cemetery that I noticed was not maintained. It was the grave of my older brother. It had been just neglected because it's just a little headstone and leaves had gotten into it and sticks and pretty soon they couldn't see it anymore so I'm not blaming them for neglecting it it's just that they couldn't see it anymore so as far as they were concerned it wasn't there next time I go I take a rake and a weed eater and we make sure that you can see it from then on but my children will have no connection with it and I understand that because there is no living connection to the people that were there. All they have is what I've told them. But because they never lived there and never knew the people, never knew the ones who were there, they will lose it in this generation. Can I give you a good word or a somber word here this morning? All that you hold dear is one generation away from extinction. It, it truly is. It really, truly is. And it can go even quicker than that. You see, memory is a funny thing. It fades very quickly. Matter of fact, as we get older, it fades even quicker. Some of it is age. The story is told of Ralph Waldo Emerson in his later years suffered from an increasingly faulty memory. I, I got that. I, I used to laugh about that when I was a little bit younger, but I don't laugh anymore because I am them, all right? So he had an increasingly faulty memory. And sometimes Emerson would forget the names of different objects. 
he called it a naughty memory, actually. But he would forget the names of different objects, and in order to speak of them, he would refer to them in a roundabout sort of way. Like when he could not think of the word plow, he would talk about the implement that cultivates the soil. Isn't that amazing? The implement that cultivates the soil. More important was the fact that he could not remember the names of people who were quite familiar to him. At the funeral of his friend, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Emerson commented to another person, that gentleman was a sweet, beautiful soul, but I have no idea what his name is. <laughs> you know, and that's what happens with memory. The loss of memory is a sad thing. It's a tragic thing because what it does is it cuts us off from days gone by. See, that's, that's why when I go to the cemetery in Mountain View in St. Joe, there's a poignant feeling that I have, a, a sense of loss because I realize that my children will never, have never touched that which was so precious to me. And so they are cut off from that past. It's a distant affection. It's a distant memory for them. They really have no connection to it. Same thing happens in faith, guys. It happens very quickly. The loss of memory cuts us off from the days gone by. It strips away the treasured residue of past experiences. It erases our personal history and leaves us unaccountably blank pages. Alzheimer's disease, uh, does, Alzheimer's disease does that. It erases our personal history and leaves us with huge blank spots as we try to remember names, places, and then people. It leaves a huge hurt as someone we have loved all of our lives suddenly cannot remember our names or our faces any longer. But that's not always the case. Sometimes disease or old age have nothing to do with our forgetfulness. Sometimes we are forgetful because we neglected that which has gone before us or that which we have held in our hand. And we become unattentive, inattentive to those who have preceded us. And when that happens, hear this. We center all of our attention only on our time and place and what matters to us right now. Let me say that one more time. When we lose touch with the past, whether it's the distant past or our immediate past, we then center all of our attention only on our time and place. We act as though the present is all that matters and the past is some shabby thing that can be easily cast off behind like a worn out pair of shoes. Unfortunately, when you lose touch with the past, it clouds the present and darkens the future. This Memorial Day weekend, there's a lot of plans people are making. But pretty much it centers around barbecue. It centers around going to the beach or the river or the lakes and that kind of a celebration. We got a lot of red, white, and blue. But something has been missing. Something is missing. We need to be aware that on this occasion we are called to remember and respect those who have died, those whose days are gone. And it's no surprise to us that many people don't reflect on that past during this holiday any more than they do any other time of the year. Matter of fact, in our ever-accelerating uh, time of change, the past gets behind us quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker till we just don't remember anymore. It's almost like what happens on your computer once you get too much stuff on it. If you're not careful, it will, it will clean itself for you, and you'll lose important things that you thought were treasured forever. Now, I want you to hear me something. Hear something from me. I'm not here to be an advocate of a renewed Memorial Day. All right, hear me. I'm a patriot. I love the Lord. I love my nation. And I've traveled enough to know I really love this nation more than any other place I've ever been in my life. So I got that. But this is not for a renewed practice of Memorial Day. This, this holiday is not an expressly religious holiday. It is secular. Matter of fact, it started about 160 years ago on the fields of Gettysburg with Abraham Lincoln is really pretty well where it started and it had something had all to do with the dead of the Civil War and we need to remember that but you need we need to understand something else this morning a failure of memory 
destroys our connection with that which matters, that which was past. And again, it clouds our present. And it takes our future, well, it takes our present out of context. And it completely darkens our hopeful expectations for our tomorrows. That's why in Scripture, you see repeatedly calls to remember. So could you please stand with me as we honor and reverence the reading of God's Word? I love Joshua. Joshua is the most hopeful, expectant book in the Bible. It really is. It's about victory. And I, and I love it. And I love the name Yahshua. God saves. That's what it is. That's, that's, all, that's what it's all about here this morning. And it says, and it came to pass when all, verse, verse 1, it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan. From the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take a stone on his shoulder, which indicates they were large stones. Which indicates they were large stones. According to the number of the tribes of, of the children of Israel, that this may be assigned to you among you when your children ask in times come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Grab that. See, there's sometimes we, we miss little bitty things in Scripture. It didn't ask, what do these stones mean? It says, tell me what these stones mean to you. That's the key here this morning. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan the, uh, forever, forever. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan. As the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they are there to this day. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. Bless us now as we partake of it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I got an opportunity here a while back to journey to the Jordan in, in, while we were in Israel. And one thing I noticed that is notably missing, we actually journeyed to the part of the Jordan, not only where Jesus was baptized, but where the nation of Israel passed over on that day. It was a very poignant, it was a very powerful place to be that day. But one thing I have noticed is though it says in Joshua, a book that was written several thousand years ago, that those stones were there even to this day. They're not there now. They're not there now. They're definitely not in the Jordan. There may be a monument somewhere where the other 12 stones are supposedly at. I, I do not really know that, but they're not there where I was there, when I was there. Now, that may be because enemies have occupied that land for generations. The Jordanians were the last before the Israelis, and, and uh, throughout the entire area there, they have tried to remove anything that is uh, Judeo-Christian-centric. Uh, they want to destroy that because to destroy that, they can take that, that, those promises and, and not negate them necessarily, but make it so that you don't pay attention to them anymore. Those stones are not there. Those stones are definitely not there in the Jordan. And we need to hear this this morning because uh, those stones were put there for a purpose so that the people of God would remember. And again, that statement, I'm not interested in what the faith meant to your parents. I'm not interested in what it meant to your grandparents. Some of you had faithful grandparents and faithful parents and, and par grandparents of generations. And it's not important. Your children are not as, are not as, are not as uh, concerned about what it meant to them several generations past. But I want to ask, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does Jesus really mean to you? What does the church really mean to you? What does Christ really mean to you here this morning? And throughout Scripture, they set up memorials. Because there was some, there, of course, we are created in the image of God. God created us. He knows what we are. That may make you feel comfortable. It should make you squirm just a little bit. 
And God knew who we were and how we thought and how our minds worked. And he set up memorials because he understood that forgetfulness will erode the foundations of our relationship with God and our faith. Forgetfulness always does that. And how very quickly we forget. Now, you know, if, if anybody knows Pastor Brady right now, here in the next 30 minutes or next few minutes when we leave here this morning and you've got something to tell me, what am I going to tell you to do? Text me. Text me. That's what I'm going to say because I've got great intentions to remember, but the minute you walk away, I'm onto something else and I forget. It's not that it's important, but my hard drive is about full. That's just what it amounts to here this morning. And, uh, so, and I forget so quickly. So I need some helpers here this morning. We forget so fast. We forget the things that are important that we thought we would never forget. The things that were so precious, we thought we would never forget them. But it's so often, it's like the wind blowing among the ashes. It's there one minute, and then it's gone. That which was so importantly, important to us is suddenly swept away as though it was never there. That's why the monuments throughout Scripture are there. They were there not to use as road maps, but to remind us what God had done for his people you see because when you forget what god has done for people in times past or what god has done for you in late lately or what god has done for you in years past it puts the present out of context and then we begin to focus everything upon now we become self-absorbed we become self-centered self-motivated, self-driven. We forget what God has done, and the only thing that, and when we forget what God has done in our lives, there's one thing that rises to the top. It happened with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve forgot what God had told them, not that they forgot, but they neglected it and they did their own thing, self rises to the top. And when self rises to the top, sin enters in. And the, and the downfall begins. That's what has happened as a nation. That's what happens as, uh, as, 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 a, as, as a people. That's what happens to us as individuals. No wonder God said, be diligent to your soul, lest you forget. It erodes our foundation of faith. It erodes, erodes our relationship with God. Secondly, here this morning, it's important that we remember because those who forget fall into a place of thanklessness. They just stop thanking people. They just, the thankfulness goes out the window. It's a lot, and it's, unlike, it's unlikely, we saw that with the, the children of Israel, and it's unlikely that we do, but we'll do any better. If we forget the value of our heritage and the source of our blessing, it will become very easy for, to take, for us to take for granted all that we have and all that we are. In the March of 2003, in northern France, at one of the largest British war cemeteries in France, Hate-filled vandals sprayed painted red paint all over a monument to Britain's dead from World War I. The vandals who, wrote, who, 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 who did this uh, did not represent the majority of the French people because I'll tell you, in Normandy, they love Americans. They love the Canadians and the British because they, they remember and they celebrate what has been done. But not everybody does. And these vandals obviously didn't because they spray painted all over that monument. And the words were this, dig up your dead. Dig up your garbage and take it home. It fouls our soil. A whole generation, if we're not careful, has forgotten the sacrifice of others. This, this, this statement shows a disconnect, complete disconnect with the history and the sacrifice of the brave men and women of that generation who selflessly depended, defended the nation in which they were buried. It, refli- it reflects a profound spirit of thanklessness. Now, while that is, a, 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 I know it's an extreme example. I got that. I, I understand that. If we can, to lesser degrees, we can and do fall into the very same trap. We simply forget, and we fall prey to self-absorption and pride, which, by the way, is our default setting. Did you know that? If we're left all to ourselves without grace, self-absorption and pride is ours. Kind of like the, the rich man in the New Testament. He built these big old granaries, and he says, Man, oh man, let me look at this. Look what I have done. See pride? 
Now I'm going to sit back and I'm just going to take it easy. Self-absorption. That's our default setting. And that default setting is always triggered by a spirit of thanklessness. With the blindness of pride, we begin trusting in our own wisdom and power rather than relying upon the guidance and might of our Maker. Then in a wrong-headed self-confidence, we simply lose our way. We simply lose our way. We need to hear that this morning. Now, I need you also to understand something. Sometimes dwelling on the past can be a bad thing. All right? not, not usually, but sometimes it can be a bad thing. Sometimes dwelling on the past is a means of escaping the problems of the, presence, of the present and the disturbing prospect of the future. Sometimes we're tempted to glorify days gone by. I suppose we all know folks, and as I get older I become more and more one of them, who continually talk about how great things used to be. Life was simpler back then. Life was just, in some ways, easier. I don't really remember all that. I'm really a child of the late 70s and 80s, and I've lived long enough to know those were not good times. <laughs> those were tough times. But sometimes we're tempted to look back upon where we were, and we glorify it in such a way that it becomes the golden age of our existence. Some psychologists have called this the golden age syndrome. For some folks, it is the 20s. Some is the 30s or the 40s or the 50s or the 60s. But whatever it is, we look back upon those days, and that's our favorite period of our life. But the problem with looking back to a golden age is that we distort the past, and we come to believe that the best days of our lives have already gone by. Can we, let me say that one more time, because sometimes we need to repeat stuff. Or maybe you don't need it, but I need to repeat it. Sometimes when we glorify the past... We begin to think that those were the best days, and it distorts the, we distort the past, and we come to believe that the best days of our life have, have already gone by. So everything else that follows is anticlimactic. Consequently, some people who are disappointed with the present and distressed over the future tend to live in the past. Their memories are important to them, but they don't have hopeful memories. They don't have hopeful memories. You see, hopeful memories are those things that do not drag us into the past and lock us there. Hopeful memory, does not tell us, hopeful memory does not tell us that the best of life has already come and already gone. Rather, a hopeful memory thrusts us into the future because we see what was possible in the past. We experience what is possible in the present, and we look forward to what God has in store. When the prophets of old called upon the people of God and the prophets of old called upon God's people and told them to remember the works of the Lord that he had done in the past this was not to take and keep him locked in the past instead it was to prepare them for the future they were not called upon to remember the past for its own sake the practice was not a self-indulgent diversion Rather, they were, they were there, they were to remember the wonders of the past so that their lives would be open to, even greater, to the even greater wonders of God would do for them in the future. God's done great things in the past. Praise His holy name. And I love memorials here today. But I'm a hopeful person. I don't believe that the best days are gone. I believe that they are yet ahead of us here today. I think it's a hopeful expectation, a hopeful expectation based upon what I have experienced with God. You know what? I love, there's, there's a, I love the text, but I love there's an old song. I know whom I have believed in. That's past tense. And I am persuaded now. That's the idea. I'm right now. I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's hopeful memory. This I know because this is what I've experienced. And because I know this today, I know that tomorrow he's got it going on too. It's hopeful expectation here this morning. The Lord's Supper is a hopeful memorial. And we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. The Lord's Supper is a hopeful memory, a hopeful memorial. No wonder Jesus said, as often as you come together, do these things. It doesn't falsely glorify the past. You see, when we partake of the bread and cup, we remember the broken body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the images of deceit, his betrayal, how everybody forsook him, the cruelty. We remember all those things, and they're, they're, they're ingrained upon our mind. And the memorial feast or the, the, the Lord's Supper convinces, confronts us with the disquieting fact that we humans are all too capable capable of striking against, out against holiness and the supreme goodness of our God. Matter of fact, humanity has gotten to the place where they treat holiness and the goodness of God as almost if it were demonic. It's something they're running from. The Lord's Supper reminds us of all we hold dear. It reminds us of his life. And it reminds us of his death. Words matter. Did you know that? Words really do matter. It seems as if one of the things that I hear a lot from a lot of folks is that Jesus died for my sins. Well, he did die for my sins. Praise God. He shed his blood for my sins. But he also died because of my sins. See, there's, there's, there's a, a small difference, it sounds like, in the English language, but it's a huge difference when it comes to approaching Christ in this moment. It's a huge difference when we begin to look at our own unholiness and the holiness of Christ. By his stripes we are healed. He bore my iniquity. My, the punishment for my sin was upon him and you know what he loved me anyway he loved me anyway and he loves me now and I need you to understand something there's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore I was talking to someone the other day and I don't know who it was it was that was asking me about but the question came up well does God love homosexuals I said absolutely See, well, my Bible tells me that for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, absolutely. God loved you when you were evil too, by the way. And he has extended his mercy and his grace to you. You no longer live in the sin that he died because of. But that you live in such a way that he sets you free. You know, when I asked Christ into my heart, and Carol, you said that, when I ask Christ into my heart, what it does is opens up the door for a brand new way of living. You see, there's some things, again, that I, I'm fixing to close. We're going to have some more. There's some things that I hear around me that I just don't agree with anymore. I don't believe that if you're an addict, you have to stay an addict. I believe he's made me a new creation in Christ. Isn't that cool? If I'm an alcoholic, I ain't got to stay an alcoholic. My Bible does not say that. It says I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, created for good works, which he ordained before we ever came to be. If I'm a liar and a thief, he said don't steal anymore. Stop it. Because someone living in you now is different from who was in charge before. If you're an adulterer, See, we like, we like to categorize sins, don't we? We got that, because if I categorize it, I can, I can handle it a little bit better, and I can measure myself up against you. <laughs> no, there's no category. Evil is evil, and death is death. Sin is sin. But he loves you. And he died for your sins and because of your sins and loves you anyway. And he extends the hand of mercy compassion and grace it says what is is not how it has to be I offer you a brand new beginning which is the idea of the hopeful memory see I remember what he has done <laughs> praise God I'm experiencing it right now but the last part of the Lord's Supper he says as oft as you take this bread and you drink this wine you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. In other words, the best is yet to come. And we need to live, even today, 
as though the best is yet to come. Carol, I love that little analogy that you had. You see, because I tasted the bread, just so you'll know. I didn't taste your bread. But my memory kicked in, boy. I tasted sourdough. I tasted Ezekiel bread because every time she said it, I thought, I got that. Oatmeal bread. I, I tasted it all. And something happened to me physically. I began to, I began to hunger for it. Memory has that ability to once again cause us to hunger for that which we've forgotten. And that's what I pray that God will do for you this Memorial Weekend. So just very simply, make time. The problem with us is we let time drive us. Make time. Carve it out of your time. Make the time. Be still and just be quiet before the Lord. Be honest. Lord, I've been running this race without you for too long. I know you haven't forgotten me, but I've forgotten you. Forgive me. And he does a cool thing at that point. Not does he forgive us of our sins. He fixes what's broken. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And he spends the rest of our days. This is the part I really like. We're going to. He spends the rest of my existence undoing all that sin has done in my life. That's hopeful memory. That's a hopeful expectation that we rest in here today. I've asked Gary to come help me. Can you leave that? Can you leave that? If you can, I can help you. You know, again, what I, what I love about Christ is he knows me too well. He knows how quickly I forget. He knows how quickly I get distracted. He knows how quickly other things get my attention. And just like an old preacher friend said of mine years ago, a preacher of mine said years ago, whatever's got your attention has got you. And there comes moments in our existence where we just need to stop what we're doing. Behold the King and let him have our full undivided attention. In moments like that, he will transform your life. So I want you to stand this morning. And we're going to sing that chorus in just a moment. I'm going to pray first, and we're going to sing that chorus. And then I would ask you, if you would, if you'd like to partake of the elements, to move out of your seat, come, receive the elements into your hand. And you can go back to your seat if you want to, or you can kneel at an altar of prayer. But just hold the elements in your hand, and let's not take it until we can take it as a complete congregation. And instead of just getting occupied with other thoughts and other things this morning, get quiet and meditate upon the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask that he would take and instill in you hopeful memories this morning that change everything. Would you do that? Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for memorials. I thank you, Lord, that they cause my imagination to soar. They enlighten my understanding. They enlighten my mind. And they rock my world so often. So would you do that again this morning as we come in these moments and get quiet before the King? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come as we sing. Oh, the glory of your presence, we your temple give you reverence, so well rise to your rest, and be blessed by our
Remember what it said in Joshua, the fourth chapter? When the children gather around their moms and their dads and their grandparents, and they ask mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, tell me, what does this mean to you? That's our charge this morning. That's our privilege to pass on that which passed on to us. So this morning, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with those that he loved. Even though he knew they'd let him down, he gathered with them anyway. And when they had gotten together, he took the bread and he offered thanks. Lord, thank you for the bread here this morning. He said, this is my body broken for you. When you take and you eat it, do so in remembrance that Christ died for you. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is my blood, the blood of the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink it, you remember not only that Christ died for you, but he died because of you. Let that humble you. Let that set you free. As often as you drink it, you remember that Christ died for you. For as often as you drink this cup and you eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And come again, he will. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And now, Lord, we're just going to praise you. The God from whom all blessings flow here this morning, how good you are in our midst. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that praise God from whom all blessings flow here this morning. Praise God. I'm sorry, I messed all up, didn't I? <laughs> Not Donna. There we go, I got that. Praise God. bless you and keep you and cause its face to shine upon you both now and forevermore. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>